A couple of weeks ago, we began a series on why pray. <laughs> it shut off, okay. And, and the question really I, I want you to think about this morning, why do you pray? Is it about getting something from God? Because we're going to hear the story about a, a lady who's uh, a widow, and she has probably reached the point of nag. At least that's what the judge feels like as she keeps coming to him, wanting him, her, him as a judge to rule on, on her behalf, and he's been trying to ignore her. In fact, the word says that he has no interest in God and can care less about people. But he is concerned about his own well-being because his, her nagging will so much get to him that he says, and Kate, she's going to so wear me down, I'm going to rule just to get rid of her. Now, the mistake that we could make is to say, and that's what we're supposed to learn about prayer. That we just need to go keep hammering and knocking and begging and pleading like the little two-year-old who's standing there at the candy bar at the front of the grocery store. I want that candy, mommy. Please, I want that candy. Why don't you let me have that candy, mommy? I want that. And we've all seen them, right? And what do you do? Mom says, I can't take it anymore. Here's the candy. Shut up, please. Right? But if she's really going to be strong, she's going to say, no, you can't have that candy. And in fact, your tantrum is going to get you probably some more problems. <laughs> I suggest that you stop now. Or we'll have more fun later. <laughs> but you know, when mom's got two other children on her sleeve, and, and that child's still making noise, sometimes we're really tempted just to take the sucker and shut up, right? No, no, no one would ever do such a thing. But that's not what Jesus is trying to teach us about prayer. As we started this series, we said that prayer is about a personal relationship with God. You need to remember that every week as we look at this and we study different things about prayer. Prayer is totally and completely about a personal relationship with God. It's about the opportunity to connect with him, the opportunity to communicate with him. It's about the opportunity to listen to him. Now, sometimes we don't give you much time in worship, right, to just be silent. Wasn't that sacred there a few moments ago? Sometimes we don't need words, do we? And it's okay. In fact... I have a feeling, I haven't done any statistical research on this. I just have this feeling we talk a lot more to God than we listen. Did it happen to you? You ever thought about how much time you spend in just being quiet and listening to God? I think the first week I mentioned this, that I would suggest that one of the great things that you can do is have a pad and a pencil or a pen and your Bible and get off alone somewhere where you don't have a video game, where you don't have a text message, where you don't have a cell phone, where you don't have the telephone, where you don't have somebody crying and grabbing a hold of you and saying, hey, you get alone with just God and you. Do it somewhere where you're going to stay awake, not going to fall asleep, okay, if you've been, especially if you've been working all night. Okay? Make sure of that, right? But get alone and then say, God, I'm here to listen. You may want to take and read a couple psalms just to celebrate who he is, just to praise him and acknowledge his greatness, and then listen. And while you're listening, get your pen and pe or pencil ready for what he says. God wants a relationship with you. Prayer is about a relationship. So this morning we're looking at Luke chapter 18, verses um, 1 through 8. And Jesus, uh, Luke is actually going to explain to us the purpose of the parable. Now, every parable has usually one message. 
right? There's a, there's a storyline, and there's one point that Jesus is trying to make with his story. And in this case, Luke actually explains ahead of time, this is why Jesus is going to tell us this story. He wants us to learn this. Luke 18, verse 1, Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. What's the purpose of the parable? Pray and don't give up. Pray and don't give up. Right? Uh, the King James Version says, pray and don't faint. It, it's a, we're supposed to pray and keep on praying. Now, doesn't that sound like, you know, then maybe we are supposed to go in there, Jesus, I want it, 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 Jesus, I want it. Is, it, is, that, is, that, is that what we're supposed to do? I don't think so. To pray and not give up. Well, we're going to see it as we end the message, but I might as well tell you right now. What did Jesus teach when he was teaching his lessons on prayer to the disciples? In the prayer we call the Our Father, some people call it that, some people call it the Lord's Prayer. I call it the Lord's teaching on prayer. Because really it was that. He gave an outline, an instruction manual, if will, to the disciples who were actually asking. Luke tells us the story. The disciples came to Jesus and teach us how to pray. And he says, well, okay, here, pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Just repeat that phrase with me. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is the focus of our prayer this morning. As Jesus is talking, he's saying, look, I want you to learn how to pray and keep on praying. I want you to stay at this thing of prayer. I want you to learn how to understand my kingdom and my will. Most of us throw our requests up to God and wait to see if they catch. And what God is wanting is for us to come talk to him and for him to share with us what his will is. You see, God's interested in communicating himself with us. And some of us, we just, you know, okay, somebody says, you know, okay, pray for my aunt. She's got a bunion on her right knee. I don't know if you get bunions on your right knee, but she's got one, and it's a really a bummer, okay? <laughs> Probably only on the feet, right, Rose? <laughs> okay, well, she's got one on the right knee, so it's worse. <laughs> and so we, oh, Lord, help my aunt Matilda with her bunion on her right knee, okay? Well, did we ask God what the bunion's there for? You might want to if they don't belong on the knee and they're only on the feet, okay? But, we, we need to come and ask God more, a lot more than just throw up this thing of, you know, hey, God, I want something. God, please do this, you know, whatever it might be. Does God heal, ladies and gentlemen? Yes, yes he does. Still today, doesn't he? Yes. he? Does he still do miracles there for them? Yes. yes, he does. Does God answer the requests of imperfect, sinful, rotten, ruined, messed up people? Amen, he does. Because if he doesn't, we're all in trouble. <laughs> God listens. God wants to talk with us as well. How do you know what the will of the Lord is? Do you just assume it? You go to God and you know, well, God, I know you want to do this. Really? How do you know that's what God wants to do? Now, there are some things he's kind of told us, right? And so when you go to him and you say, hey, God, I'm having an affair. I want to marry that girl and get rid of the spouse I have. What's God going to say? Um, <clears throat> you, you know where you're at? <laughs> but there's more intense things, aren't there? God, that person was mean and you know, I just want them to suffer a little. I'm not thinking that's his will either, is it? Although, didn't David do that multiple times? Yeah. You read the Psalms and he, and see, see, this is why prayer is relationship. You got to really be honest with God, don't you? And sometimes it's about coming to God. God, I really do want that. Instead of being, you know, because he knows you want it anyways, right? God, I really want this guy to suffer. I mean, he shouldn't have cut me off. He's driving way too fast down the mountain. Give him a flat tire or something. Don't kill him, you know. I don't want it to be too messy. But, you know, mess him up somehow. Because I want him to feel it, God. And God's just kind of waiting. 
okay, are you done ranting and raving? But you see, we've got to get honest with God. And prayer is about a relationship, and therefore it's about being honest. Because can you really have a relationship with somebody who's going to sit there and lie to your face? You, you walk up to a friend, and you know, and you know this friend, okay? okay. Joseph, how close to Zach are you? Uh, pretty close. Pretty close? Okay. Can you tell when he's like uh, maybe had uh, too much pressure and stress going on over at the, ba- at the camp? Yeah, maybe a little bit. Maybe a little bit. So he walks up, and you can tell that. You can almost see it in his eyes, right? And, he, and you say, hey, Zachary, how you doing? And he says, great. And what do you say? Are you sure? <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm doing great. At some point, you say, Zachary, your face and your body are not telling the same story <laughs> that your words are. <laughs> right? Yeah, because if you're a friend and you have a relationship, then you're going to get closer to that person and you're going to know when they're not speaking the truth to you, right? Yeah. Isn't God that way? If God wants to have a relationship with us, doesn't he want to get close to us? So that's why Jesus is saying, look, I'm going to tell you a parable because with this parable, I want you to keep talking with me. I want to have this relationship with you where we keep communicating together and where you don't quit and you don't give up. Incidentally, you got to know the context of, of Luke 18. The context of Luke 18 is Luke 17. There you go. <laughs> So now, so now when you don't want to listen to me, you read Luke 17 to find out the context. No. Well, Luke 17, Jesus is talking about his return. And he's laying out some of the details of that return. In fact, it would be a good passage to read this afternoon. Or if seriously, if you get bored with me, read the word. I don't mind that. That's better than me anyways. But Luke 17, Jesus is talking about what's going to happen in his return. And there's going to be judgment and, and, and what it's going to be like and all. And he's warning about that. And then he's concerned about the fact that these people, his disciples whom he's speaking to, that they're not really ready for him to leave, let alone for him to come again. And so he's laying out the details of this and trying to prepare them for it. So he says, then Jesus told this, his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. And here's the parable. He said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. We don't know what she was coming with. We do know that widows had a really hard lot. Uh, widows were not taken care of. And we also know that you could become a widow at a very young age. Uh, girls were oftentimes married by the time they were 13, 14, 15 years old. Very young. And so they, and they would oftentimes be married to, in fact, it was an arranged marriage, and they would be married to somebody who may be significantly older than them. However, even then, the husband may die in 30s or 40s, something like that. And so they could be fairly young. And so it was really tough for them. And and they had to take care of themselves. And if there was no other family there, it got really difficult. And this lady has some kind of a suit against someone else. We... Just by looking at it, we believe that she is the one that is bringing the suit against someone who has done her harm. Guess what probably happened? Somebody has probably taken the house the, and the clothes and everything that belongs to her and her family and taken them for themselves because they just do that to widows. And so she's coming probably saying, look, I want my home back. Well, the judge, he can kind of care less. Well, let's see what he says. For some time, he refused. But finally, he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me, down, wear me out with her coming. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she is such a nag. I'm just so tired of her and all the complaining that she's doing. And, and, and the fact is, is that she probably deserves justice, but the judge doesn't have to do it because she's a woman. She's insignificant and unimportant. And not only is she a woman, she's a widow woman, which makes her even more insignificant and more unimportant in their economy. That's why, I just got to do a parenthesis here, that's why ladies... 
when you look at what Jesus did for ladies, he was saying, you are so valuable. He cut a grain totally against the, the, the day when he started pointing out how important they were. Notice, couldn't he have to told a parable about two men and a man not getting justice? No, Jesus understands women were being treated unjustly, unfairly, and wrongly. And he's going to teach, teach some things here to say how precious you are, how valuable you are. Because he's going to use this parable in where this unrighteous, unholy judge who doesn't care about people and doesn't care about God will go ahead and give justice. And he says, but what about God? In fact, that's where Jesus leads us. He says, and the Lord said, and what's, what you always want to look for is when Jesus explains a parable, <laughs> okay? Because that's really telling us what the parable is about. And, Jesus, and the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly, he will see that they get justice and quickly. Is this about the unjust judge, the parable of the unjust judge? Is this the, the parable of the importune woman the, who's um, just a, a complainer bringing her stuff back? Is this telling us that we just got to keep praying and praying and praying and praying and begging and begging and complaining and getting our point to, so that God finally will give in to us? No. Because what, what does Jesus say? He says, look, you have this woman and she's going to the judge every day and getting nowhere. But her complaining's getting on his nerves. You have this judge who could care less about anybody. He is self-centered. He is far from righteous. He, I, how he got to be a judge, nobody knows except that he probably had money. And he, can't care, he doesn't care about anybody else except he does care about his own <laughs> emotions. The stress of somebody, hey, hey, have you ever had somebody poking you? you? Keep poking you, hey, 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 hey. Okay already, leave me alone. What do you want? And that's what the, that's what the judge does. Okay, here you go. There, goodbye. Get out of here. But now what does Jesus say? But God's not like that. The unrighteous judge is this way. You got to keep bugging him. But God's not like that. They're total opposites. So see, look, Jesus is not saying you got to keep, you know, begging and pleading and trying to cull, cajole God into doing what you want. No, he's saying, look, God wants to bless you. He cares about his chosen ones. Ladies, he includes you in those chosen ones. All of us, he's saying we're all special. He says, because you are special, I want to help you. I want to bless you. I want to meet your needs. I want to give you. I want to, I want to love you. I want to pour out on you my love. God wants to do that. It's his, it's, his, it's his desire. He's committed to it. So that's not what prayer is about then, is it? God, please, God, please. God. No. He's saying, look, God's longing to do that. But to do that, he's wanting us to come to him. He's wanting us to actually come to him. Because in coming, we start to build the relationship. Prayer is a relationship. Then how does Jesus conclude? He says, however, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? It's an interesting finish to this parable. Jesus has been saying God wants us to pray continually. Correct? First Thessalonians says that, pray continually. It goes on, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. God wants us to make our requests known to him. Yes, he wants to share openly and honestly with him. But he doesn't want us to be babbling along and on and on. And he doesn't want us just to come. Here's what some, too many of our prayers are. Have you ever told somebody you'll pray for them and didn't? How many of you done that? I'll pray for you, and, and you didn't. What in the world? <laughs> okay, let's see. Now, have you ever thought, oh, I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask God for that. Have you ever asked God for something, and then a week later forgot you asked? Because maybe it really didn't matter. 
And see, that's what God's looking for. He's saying, look, keep coming to me. Come to me continually because I want to see what's really on your heart and what's really in your mind and what's really in your soul. I'm trying to see what, who you really are. And I want to open up myself to you. So you continue to converse with me. Secondly, God will bring about justice. The fact is, is that God is a righteous judge, isn't he? And he will judge fairly. And the fact is, and this is what Jesus is kind of touching on that very last sentence, he will judge. And some of us don't like that. In fact, uh, one of the phrases that we, we, we have to really watch out for is we, we get really kind of uncomfortable if somebody starts to judge us, don't we? I should warn you, you're all judging people all the time. And it's not all wrong. If I'm walking up to you like this with a gun, shouldn't you be making some judgments? <laughs> I'm thinking it would be wise to be making some judgments about me. Judge, judging is not all, all wrong. But if I say, Aaron, I condemn you to never be in heaven. Whoa! What should happen to me? Watch out. Don't be standing too close. Lightning might be coming through like it did the house the other day. <laughs> okay? Because I cannot judge him to heaven or hell, can I? I can't. I may mean, have all kinds of opinions. I think he's going to be there. Aaron saying, <laughs> but I am not the one who determines that. I don't have a say in the matter. Who does? God and Aaron. And so Jesus says, look, we need to ask God, and he will bring about justice. He, he is going to, because he's righteous. He will avenge. Romans says, do not take revenge. Any of you like to do that? Tempted to, at least? Yeah, yeah, come on, honesty. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. God is going to pay back sin. And he'll either pay it back by putting it on the cross with Jesus Christ or he'll pay it back and by giving it to the person who said they didn't want to accept Jesus' payment. And if you don't accept Jesus' payment, then you've got to pay for your own sin. And I'm sorry, that's too expensive. 2 Thessalonians 1, eight says, He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's good news. And Jesus is simply saying, look, believe in me. The obedience is, yes, I believe. I'm going to follow you, Jesus. I'm going to become like you. I want to learn from you. And he says, I, he will punish those who do not. Now, that's frustrating, isn't it? You know, don't we kind of in our, you know, everything works out kind of way, want everybody to end up in heaven, right? But there's only way to, one way to get to heaven. It's by accepting what Jesus paid for on the cross. No other way that opens up heaven. Because no other payment is good enough, perfect enough, pure enough than the spotless Lamb of God who died on the cross. John Piper says, therefore, Jesus argues, if an unjust judge can be moved by persistent petitions to help a stranger for whom he has no regard, how much more will God help his own chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? If an unjust judge is going to give in to a complainer, to a nag, how much more God will give in and bless those whom he loves and love him. Ray Steadman put it this way, when like the widow, life appears to us to be hopeless and useless, when we are victims of forces which are greater than we can manage, and who of us has not felt like this? When no openings appear in the wall of pressure which rings us about, when there is no answer to the inescapable problems before us, and there is no end in sight but certain failure or loss, Jesus says there is one way out. There is, no, there is a way to the place of power. There is a way to a certain solution of our problems. There is an answer to the unbearable pressure. It is the answer of prayer of simply crying out to a God we cannot see but whom we may rest upon. 
A father with a father's heart and a father's tender compassion and a father's willingness to act. Prayer, he says, always stirs the heart of God, always moves God to act. Revelation describes the prayers of the saints as being the incense that comes out of the altar. And they're going, those, that incense, the fragrance of the prayers of the saints is going up to God night and day. When Jesus comes back, he's going to be looking to see whether we have faith if we're still here. I tell you, Verse 8, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? If the Son of Man was to return today, would he say and find you to be faithful to him? Would your actions demonstrate to Jesus your faithfulness to him? Or your faithfulness to something or someone else. Luke 12 says, And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it, for the pagan world runs after all such things, and your Father knows that you need them. But seek His kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. You see, Jesus is going to come back to judge, but he's longing to commend the faithful. He's longing to say, yes, I find you faithful. Yes, you are serving me well. Yes, you're doing my will. Yes, you please me. J.C. Ryle asks, how many around us really believe what the Bible contains? How many live as if they believed that Jesus Christ died for them? How many of us? Do you live like Jesus Christ died for you and that there is a judgment, a heaven and a hell? Ray Steadman, again, in talking about this passage, said, Jesus does not say when the Son of Man comes will he find men praying, right? No, it is when the Son of Man comes will he find faith. For prayer is faith expressed. True prayer is not pleading or cajoling a reluctant God. Never. That is never prayer. Prayer is believing. Prayer is faith. Prayer is thanking instead of complaining. Trust instead of trying. Rejoicing. Accepting. Appropriating. Receiving. That is prayer. Isaiah 40, verse 31 says, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. What did the King James say? I want you to pray so that you won't faint. So you won't give up. Do you need to pray today? Do you need to pray tomorrow? <laughs> Do you need to pray when you're lo running on lover's lane? <laughs> Do you need to pray when you're tempted to give in to that addiction again? Do you need to pray when you're angry at that person that they did it again? It's the same thing they've done before. Do you need to pray when you sin? Do you need to pray? when you're feeling lonely and depressed and discouraged and anxious and afraid? Do you need to pray? Yes, Jesus is inviting us to come and to talk with him and to be honest and open with him. Why? Because he cares about you. He wants a relationship with you. So, let's pray. Jesus, I want your kingdom to come here on earth and your will to be done 
in each of our lives. Lord, I thank you that we don't have to be pests and nags and beg and plead to try to somehow get you to do something. I thank you, Lord, that you want to bless us. You have promised already to meet our needs according to your riches and glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. You've promised to be there in the darkest of moments. You've promised to be there in the most frightening of times to walk through those valleys with us and not to leave us alone. You've promised to give us the resources to eat.